Okay, it's lovely to be joined uh, this evening from New York by Dory Clark, who is a marketing consultant, keynote speaker, and award-winning author. Um, Dory has published a number of books, including this latest one, uh, Entrepreneurial You, published by Harvard Business Review Press. And there's a, another one uh, being, being baked at the moment, Dory, as I understand, but we, we look forward to seeing that possibly in the next few months. Um, Dory, you've been very, very successful at what you do, which is essentially about um, telling people how to brand themselves, how to market themselves, and more to the point, how to make a living uh, from, from this kind of um, self-employed, lovely, indulgent lifestyle that I think a lot of people would have, but you want to put some dollar signs in there as, as well. Um, and you've been very successful at that, but I want to take you back to where it all started for you, because um, you started your career as a journalist, and... Uh, uh, unfortunately, things didn't go terribly well around the time of the uh, 9-11 dot-com crash. And you found yourself in a situation where, where you lost your job and you reinvented yourself. Um, I mean, something that I guess looking back on that now, you probably think that's probably the best thing that ever happened to you. But I'm just kind of wondering if maybe there's some echoes in that for, for people here who might be looking at this and seeing uh, that maybe their own careers are beginning to come apart in industries perhaps not doing, doing very, very well. Do you feel that actually having a nudge like that and maybe even a shock to the system is a great motivator? Well, a shock to the system certainly can be a great motivator because oftentimes we're so comfortable, we, we wouldn't necessarily take the initiative to do other things. I was set on being a journalist as a career. In fact, after I had been laid off from my job at the newspaper, I actually had someone call me up and offer me a different kind of job. It was a job to be a spokesperson on a political campaign. And I originally turned him down because I said, no, no, you know, that's not what I'm interested in. I want to stay being a journalist. And it was only later, it was about, a, it took me about an hour of just like feverishly running through it in my mind where I well, that's actually ridiculous. Like I've been, I've been trying to get another job and not succeeding at all. This actually sounds like an interesting opportunity. I should just go for it. And so I called him back and told him, okay, actually I, I would be interested in coming in for that interview. But I think oftentimes uh, in this sort of writ large manner, we continue on a path because we just haven't been given a reason to reflect on it or to change on it. It's like, well, we made a decision. Let's just keep going. And so oftentimes there needs to be a forcing function unless you are deliberately setting aside time for strategic analysis, which of course is a, a good idea, but one that people don't often do. And moments like this where there's huge disruption of industries, disruption of companies uh, can often enable people to ask themselves questions that they might not have willingly done when they were immersed in the hurly-burly of life. Mm -hmm. And just moving on from that, I mean, to look at the whole question of motivation, uh, you're very um, open in the book about the mistakes, the early mistakes that you made. And it's, it's, it's very nice to have someone who sort of says, look, I didn't quite have all this worked out at the start, but I worked it out for myself. So you talk about things like maybe not charging enough um, for, for what you're doing. And also perhaps there are periods there where you're wondering, is this really, really gonna, gonna work out? Obviously worked out very successful for you in the end, but there may have been elements there perhaps of uh, a little bit of, um, of, of self-doubt. And I guess a lot of people going down this particular route, might, it mightn't quite click together for them just, just at the early, early stages. Have you any tips in terms of motivation? Is it about um, courage and resilience and believing in yourself and pushing through until you make success of things? Well, you know, ultimately, Frank, I'm I'm a, a fan of having a low bar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's good and bad sides to it. Because for me, the job that I was coming from uh, directly before starting my own business was running a nonprofit organization. And the truth was, I was making so little money. I actually, you know, to your point about self-doubt, I actually didn't have a lot of self-doubt per se, because mm -hmm. I thought, like, literally... There is almost no way I can earn less than what I am making now, and so it felt it felt not that risky in some ways because uh, because I was coming from this place where I you know I, I was working uh, as like slave labor for this uh, for this NGO, so uh, so I felt okay about that. But also to your point, 
the challenge that that came with it was I was coming out of a universe where the scale of pay was so low, I didn't have any concept or idea of what normal or rational rates were to charge in the corporate world. So I absolutely, in my first few years of business, charged too little. Um, one of the things that I really advise people to do now that I, I didn't have enough of was to, to actively cultivate friendships and relationships with other people in your industry. Sometimes people erroneously think that you know other consultants or other whatever it is that you do are your competitors. They are not your competitors. You're competing against yourself or more to the point, you're competing against clients that either don't do something or they do it internally or whatever. There, there is all the reason in the world to create positive friendships and collaborative relationships with other practitioners in your industry. And one of the biggest is that it helps give you a sense of what people actually are charging and, and doing in the marketplace. And it gives you a lot more permission to raise your rates, especially if, as I was, you are coming out of a background where, you know, when I was running the nonprofit, I would stress out about paying a hundred dollars for copier paper. I mean, that's the kind of you know world we were living in. So the idea of charging people money uh, for my work was very fraught, uh, and that's something you have to learn to break out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just picking up on your your note there about um, contacts. Uh, I think you say in the book that uh, sometimes it's the second or third degree of separation in terms of the contacts that will get you to where you're at. So there's not necessarily that you look at your LinkedIn connection and you say, great, I have the, the marketing manager there of Google or whatever. But if you have someone who knows that person or someone who knows that person who knows that person can be just as effective. So looking beyond the, the pure first degree contacts, very important. Absolutely, that's true. And I think sometimes we, especially if we are in a position where we're immersing ourselves in a new job or a new company or a new field, we might need to transform our networks. Um, the people that we've known in the past, I mean, they may not. In fact, they probably are not the people that we need to know now. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we abandon them and uh, and just you know drop them but it means that you actually have to be much more thoughtful and proactive about how to create a network in your new field and the truth is most adults are not very good at that you know a lot of people they stop making friends after college college is like fish in a barrel it's like oh here's 5,000 people who are all your age, who are interested in the same things, go. Like that is so easy. And then when you get into the, the world of work, nobody knows how to do it because all of a sudden people live in different towns and they have families and they may not be available 24 hours a day to have a pizza with you. And so it's a skill that we actually have to really be thoughtful and learn. Uh, for me, when I was starting my business, I had a lot of friends uh, who, like me, had worked in politics, who were journalists. That's fantastic. That's very helpful. It's nice. But you know, what it won't get you is business. <laughs> they were not the people who could hire me as a consultant. And so I really had to consciously build a new network from the ground up of mm -hmm. people who, uh, who were actually in a position to be helpful with regard to my new career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also uh, the case that you can spend an awful lot of time on these networks like LinkedIn. You spend a lot of time posting and a lot of time tweeting and things like that, which is all great. It's great for building your brand, but it won't necessarily pay your bills. But the corollary of this, as you discuss in the book, is that you could equally be spending time working in a, in a consulting job where you've just kind of one client and you're, okay, you're, you're, you're earning your keep there, but you may not be developing your business. So it's a question of getting the balance between those two. That's very true. And also, I think social media is often very pernicious. I mean, if, you know, there's plenty of ways that it can be helpful, but it's also pernicious in the sense that it fools you sometimes. It fools you into feeling like you are being productive and you are doing the work. Because if you are playing a video game or watching a YouTube video, you know that you're <laughs> that you're messing around, right? You know you're wasting time. You, you can't convince yourself otherwise. But if you are on LinkedIn, it feels like work, it looks like work, but it actually might not be getting you anything. It might be just um, a, form, a form of highbrow entertainment. And so I am a big believer in the fact that 
it's good to do a little social media for sure. It's a great way to keep yourself on the radar of the people you know, to kind of have an ambient awareness and to stay in touch with your network. That's fantastic. But don't fool yourself into thinking that eight hours a day on LinkedIn is helpful. Um, what's helpful is 15 minutes, 10 minutes a day on LinkedIn. Um, much of the rest of it is diminishing returns and you need to be smart about where you are applying your time and your effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's talk about money. <laughs> um, uh, typical mistake you say uh, when you're starting out is that you don't charge enough. I mean, you have a nice line there about uh, what you should charge is fear plus ten percent. <laughs> um, but how do you how do you strike the right balance here? Because obviously you can take that too far, and you can charge you can price yourself out of the market, and then maybe find yourself in a position where. Uh, you might have to discount your rate. And is that necessarily the best thing to be doing? You know, and are there situations where perhaps you have to walk away from, from, from a deal because it's just not right? There are definitely situations where you should walk away from a deal for sure. Um, so the way that I think about pricing, this is often the hardest part for mm. new consultants or other practitioners. Um, they have often started their business because they know how to do the thing that they do really well. They're an excellent practitioner. But if they have been working in the corporate world, typically someone else has been selling it for them. They may not actually know how to sell doing the thing that they do. And so there's a real learning curve associated with it. So there's a few things that, that you can and you should do. The first is to, as best you can, get a sense of market norms. And so part of this comes from cultivating a circle of friends who are fellow practitioners. Part of it comes, if you can, from uh, building relationships or having uh, friendships uh, where, or doing informational interviews even, with people that are not necessarily your potential clients, but people who are in the know in the field. Uh, because there's a structural advantage, right? If, you, if you're a speaker, you only know how much you're charging. If somebody hires speakers, they've, they see hundreds or thousands of proposals, so they know what's normal. So if you can actually find your way through some sort of social network, um, I don't mean a, a social networking site. I mean, literally your network of people, you know, if you can wend your way to somebody who might be willing to have a little chat with you so you, so they can fill you in and give you the behind the scenes scoop that is extraordinarily valuable in terms of getting perspective on that. Um, so, I mean, part of it is just understanding, well, what is normal, so to speak. Um, but above and beyond that, to the point that you raised, Frank, is the self-confidence piece. Even if you know that it's normal for people with your level of experience to charge, let's say $10,000 for a speech, you might feel very weird about doing that if you've never done it before. It can Just the words coming out of your lips can sound uh, kind of crazy. I'm like, oh my God, that's an hour of my time. How can I possibly ask for that? Yeah. So part of it is, is really understanding and internalizing the knowledge that you are understanding, okay, well, first of all, I know if, if he's getting it and he's getting it and she's getting it, I actually know I'm just as good. I might even be better. Mm -hmm. So I guess I do probably deserve that. That's number one. Number two is really getting clear on your value proposition. Uh, do, you, do you believe that you will create a great experience for the client? Do you believe that you will help them learn how to sell better or market better or whatever the thing is you do? If you genuinely believe that, then it, it, it may be cheap at the price. I mean, after all, if it's a, you know, a pre-COVID conference, they're probably spending $10,000 on the coffee break. Mm -hmm. So spending $10,000 on the speaker is maybe not such a big deal in that context. So I think those are some of the things that that we have to get straight in our own heads. Sure, and that's one of the things I really liked about this book, Tori. You don't you don't shy away as a lot of authors do from actually discussing the rates that are out there. And uh, I'm going to leave it up to uh, to to listeners and viewers to go out and buy the book. But for example, you'd sort of say, okay, if you're a rookie, you might be worth this. But you know, if you've got a if you're a published author, you might get X amount or whatever. And it's, it's nice. And throughout the book, actually, there's references to the various people that you've interviewed. And, and they're very uh, upfront about the type of money that they're making, which is kind of is kind of refreshing to sort of see that. So I, I think one aspect of the book that I, I particularly liked. 
But I wanted to talk to you about the notion of, of, of social proof, because that's obviously very, very important as well, that if you can get yourself to a situation where, say in your case, you're a Harvard Business Review published author, um, that's, that's great. That gives you a sort of a cachet that you can build out from. And to some extent, what you're doing there is you're, you're getting a piece of the value of that highly prestigious brand, be it in your case, say Forbes or, or HBO. Um, so I guess people should be looking for their own versions of this. We can't all be HBO contributors, but perhaps you can find an equivalent in your own particular sphere. That's exactly right, Frank. I am a big fan of the concept of social proof and really actively encourage people to think about how to cultivate social proof in their own professional lives. I mean, in fact, I, um, I run an online course and community called Recognized Expert. And there's really three pillars that I teach in that about how do you become a recognized expert in your field. One is content creation. One is building your network. The third is social proof because it's that valuable and that important. And I think it will continue to become even more important because the truth is people are busy, right? They're not, they're not getting less busy. They're, they're busy, they're frenzied, they're running around. And the upshot of that is that they are not very careful. They do not take a lot of time to say, well, who is this Frank Dillon? What's, what's his character? Let me evaluate very carefully. Oh, I'll read all of his articles he's ever done to see if he's a good, smart writer. They don't have time for that. They, you know, they're, they're quick, they're lazy, they're looking for heuristics. And so what they want to say is, oh, does, well, does he seem credible? Oh, well, okay, I guess he does stuff for Decision Ireland. That seems pretty critical. Or, you know, all right, good. You know, he's, he's a credible enough guy for me to talk to. That's how people are making decisions these days. And so if we can find ways to be very meticulous and targeted in thinking about how do we cultivate our connections and relationships with keystone brands, whether it's a university, a publication, uh, marquee clients, it enables people to make faster decisions to be willing to listen to us and to at least give us the benefit of the doubt to see what we have to say. Um, otherwise, no is a lot easier of an answer than yes. And yeah. so we just want to find our way in the door. Okay, so it gives you a, it gives you a shorthand that people sort of say, well, I know, I know HBO, and if Dory Clark is good enough for HBO, that's good enough for me. <laughs> um, but coming back to some of the, the, the techniques and, and the platforms that you, you believe in, in, in using, um, not so much a platform, but good old-fashioned email. You're a big fan of this and building up the, the email subscriber base. Tell us, tell us why you think that's so important. Yeah, I, I do. I like kicking it old school, Frank. It's true. Uh, the Part of the big reason why I'm a big fan of uh, connecting with customers, with clients, with potential clients via email is a very practical one, which is that so often these days, the public discourse around marketing is all centered around social media. And oh, well, how many followers do you have on social media? I feel like it's the lazy man's way of doing it because- it's just, it's easy for people to, to, to look at the numbers and, the, and they feel like they have it all figured out. Oh, well, I see you have a million followers, so that must be great. Well, okay, first of all, the person might have bought them, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's credible. Number two, the engagement rates on social media are often terrible. And part of the reason for that is that for these publicly traded companies, and they're pretty much all publicly traded now. I mean, Facebook is, and uh, you know, YouTube, of course, is part of Google. Uh, Instagram is part of Facebook, etc. Um, they are incented to try to continually ratchet down your ability to reach your own followers because they want you to give them money in order to advertise paid posts. So that's not going to change. I don't, I don't see, you know, some massive thing where all of a sudden they're going to say, oh, you know, we don't actually need your money, right? They're going to, it's only going to go in one direction. Whereas if you have somebody who signs up for your email list, they have given explicit permission for you with no middleman to reach out to them and have a, have a, you know, two-way conversation, which is incredibly powerful. And so the key of course, which is you know, not always easy, is making sure it's worthwhile for them. 
you know, making sure that your email marketing is not just some boring cookie cutter thing that everybody else has, but is actually interesting, is actually useful. But if it is, people will reward you handsomely. And the open rates, you know, the average open rates for email, it's 20, you know, off of an email is 20, 25%. That is an order of magnitude. That is 10x what uh, the rate is for people seeing and or engaging with a social media post. So it's just dramatically different. And it's it's something that I very much advocate and have used in, in my own business as well. I am a big fan of it and have put a lot of time and effort into creating a great email marketing experience for the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of conventional wisdom would suggest that people should specialize in one particular area, be very, very niche focused. This is what I do. I'm, I'm a trainer and I train in this particular area. But you advocate in the book that it's probably a better idea to have a number of different things going on, you know, uh, to diversify your income stream. Why is that the case, do you think? So you raise a great point, Frank, and, and just to just to sort of clarify slightly, because sometimes people will say, oh, but you know, how, how can you possibly do that? Won't that dilute your impact? And so I want to be clear, it's not that I'm suggesting that people do radically different things that have radically different audiences, right? I'm, I'm not saying you need to be a real estate investor and a skydive instructor and a horse breeder uh, and, a, you know, a tennis pro. Um, th that takes a huge amount of time to, to figure out and to learn all those things. What I am saying is something that a lot of people don't do, which actually, if we're smart about it, is a little bit of a low-hanging fruit, is to ask yourself two crucial questions. Number one, am I currently turning away people who are prospective customers that if I tweaked the offer just a little bit, I could actually bring them in? I mean, for instance... If you are a high-priced consultant and you're only dealing with people who will pay you $50,000 or $100,000 or more, that's a very small fraction of the population that has the ability to do that. But there might be a lot more people that would be interested if you did a one-day workshop for $1,000 or if you did an online training program for $100. And so you could tap those audiences that otherwise you know, would be interested but can't buy now. And then, of course, we can ask ourselves, well, okay, with my existing audience, are there other things I could offer them that they might also like to buy? And if we ask those things, we can go into new product lines and it, it becomes a sort of organic flywheel of business that enhances everything. Mm. And extending that also, you can, as you say in the book here, every consultant sort of says, well, gosh, if only I could clone myself, I could get X. 4x times amount amount of business but one way that you could do this is through licensing and again this is another way in which you could probably develop your brand but you you have to do it in a particular way could you just uh, describe briefly what you have in mind there sure so licensing is a bit of an advanced strategy so it's not for everybody but i wanted to include it in the book, in Entrepreneurial You, because I feel like it is a useful strategy for people to at least be aware of and to perhaps be thinking about. But the, the basic idea is that if you can build up enough traction around your idea, eventually, or you know, about the methodology that you use, uh, eventually it may in fact be too much for you personally to deliver. So if you can codify a set of principles and train people in it, uh, and they would find it meeting a need that everybody's like, oh my gosh, I would love a process that I can give to my clients around how to do X, Y, Z. Or if just you have become famous yourself and it's, oh, well, you know, yes, I would love to be trained in the Dory Clark methodology. Everybody wants that. Um, then people pay you for the privilege. And, you know, there's different ways of doing it. Sometimes it's a one-time fee, which is usually higher. Sometimes it is an annual fee where there's recertification, but it can become a, a great uh, income stream and also a way to spread the impact of what you're doing far beyond what you'd be able to, uh, to deliver yourself personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, another channel that, that people are increasingly using to market themselves is the whole area of podcasts and, and podcasts have exploded on, on both sides of the Atlantic, massive uh, area uh, here at the moment that 
a lot of marketing um, professionals and consultants are, are getting involved in this. Any quick tips in terms of what makes a really good podcast? I would say, Frank, there's probably two key ingredients in creating a, a great podcast. The first is actually at a very basic level, consistency. Uh, because one of the, uh, the interesting studies that I shared in Entrepreneurial U is that there was a study done a few years ago by a guy named uh, Josh Marshall. And he discovered that the average podcast lasted only 12 episodes before its creator st shut it down and stopped creating new ones. And I think that really speaks to, uh, you know, the human condition in some ways, right? We're all wired for this kind of instant gratification, like, oh, I did 12 episodes and I'm not famous yet. And so they, <laughs> they give up and they lose interest. Yeah. But what it really takes oftentimes is, you know, it takes hundreds of episodes and that is a huge commitment for sure. So you need to make sure that you are getting something out of the process, that, that you are focusing on a topic that you love talking about, or that you are using it as a lever to connect with people that you are so happy to get to meet. But if you can do that and create the motivation, it becomes a very powerful tool over time. Uh, and then the second piece that I would say is really critical here is focus. Because the truth is, unless you are a celebrity already, people don't necessarily want to hear everything you're interested in, right? Like Oprah is famous enough that like, oh, Oprah wants to talk about um, how to sleep better today. And Oprah wants to talk about how to raise smart kids tomorrow. And, you know, Thursday, she wants to do something about uh, the new science of psychedelics. Fantastic. I'll go on that ride because I love Oprah. But if you are a random person, people are like, what is this? I, this doesn't make any sense. So you need to be a lot more niched down because they're going to be drawn to the subject matter rather than you as a host, at least in the beginning. Sure, sure. And leaving aside the question of money, and obviously we need to have enough money so that we can, uh, can be comfortable in the life. But one of the more interesting um, chapters I thought in your book was about living the life that you want. And I, I guess that uh, things are in, in, a, in a state of flux at, at the moment. But this notion of being tied to tied to the office, um, nine to five, all of that to some extent has gone out the window with the whole COVID situation. The only yeah, apparently we're all living the life we want during COVID. <laughs> the downside of that really is that we're kind of prisoners in our own homes and we can't we can't go to the south of France or wherever it might be and and live that fabulous life and log into our computer and work from 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 anywhere. But do you get a sense? that perhaps because the traditional structures have broken down, that when we can get back to this notion of traveling and being anywhere, that there's a whole exciting new vista that's gonna open up, up for us now suddenly. I think there's no question that the, the sudden and abrupt changes that we had to adjust to with COVID are going to have a lasting impact. I mean, it, it's just, it's hard to believe that if someone has managed, if an employee has managed to successfully work from remote for a year and has been able to demonstrate that there's no dip in their performance, um, I, I, it's very hard to believe that whenever the vaccine comes, that their boss could actually justifiably say, you must be back in the office. Um, they, they already have the proof that it's fine for them to not be in the office. So I think there is going to be a lot more of the digital nomad lifestyle and people moving around and uh, doing, uh, doing things from remote. I think there's going to be a much higher threshold and tolerance for that, which does open up a lot of opportunities for people, whether they are entrepreneurs or whether they work inside companies and just want more flexibility. There are some interesting things emerging uh, based on tax issues uh, that uh, that companies are now having to be mindful of. You know, hey, we weren't counting on having an employee in Cambodia. <laughs> so things, things like that uh, might come into play. But in a broad sense, uh, I think there will be a lot more opportunity in that area. Mm -hmm. So something positive may come out of that situation. So nice, nice to end on an optimistic note. Um, Dory, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. 
Frank, thank you so much. It's great speaking with you. And I'll just mention for any of your readers that are interested in diving more into these questions of being more entrepreneurial, creating multiple income streams in your business. I actually have a, a free resource. It's an 88 question self-assessment that actually helps you think through how this applies in your own business and in your own life. And folks can get it for free at doryclark.com slash entrepreneur. Thanks, Dory. It's been a pleasure.